Welcome, everybody, to the 10th episode of the Wonder and All podcast. I'm Louis Schwartzberg. I'm going to be your host. And I love to make films that celebrate life and take viewers on journeys through time and scale, making the invisible visible and helping to share nature's intelligence with the world like fantastic fungi. My work has always been about combining the how of science and the why of art. And this podcast is really going to fill that sweet spot. Because what I've learned over many years of personal experience in filmmaking is that immersion in nature increases our capacity for courage, creativity, kindness, and compassion, the components that we need in order to create a world for life to flourish. That's why I'm really proud that today's podcast is supported by the Fetzer Institute. They're helping to build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us?, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. You can explore these findings and more at spiritualitystudy.org. I'd like to invite you to share your own questions for our guests throughout the live broadcast. Please submit your question in the comments section of this live stream broadcast and and let us know where you're coming from. Our team will be reading them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Today's podcast is gonna focus on music and like nature, music gives us a connection to something bigger than us and touches the deepest part of our soul. My guest today has created beautiful music for the world through her unique and inspiring compositions for films and albums, including the Moving Arts Season 3 album on Spotify. Lisbeth Scott is a singer and composer whose work has been seen on films including Avatar, Iron Man 2, Concussion, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Spider-Man, HBO's True Blood, and many, many more. She's also collaborated with John Williams, Danny Elfman, John Debney, Hans Zimmer, and James Horner, just to name a few. So welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. Uh, It's such a joy to be here with you. I love listening to your music and collaborating with you over the years. One of my favorite albums of all time is Biomusic. I Uh, listen to it every time I travel. It's so inspiring to creatively, you know, collaborate with you on the many projects we've done together. You know, I I loved working with Lisbeth on my feature film, Wings of Life for Disney Nature. And she composed the music for the Oceans and the Machu Picchu episodes on our Netflix series called Moving Art. So, Lisbeth, welcome. Thank Um, you. Thank you, Louie. I'm so happy to be here. I know that music has been your guide, your teacher, your healer, Mm -hmm. and your connection to the world. How did you discover that music was your creative voice? I grew up in a really interesting situation where I was surrounded by and experiencing a lot of anxiety and fear all the time. And I didn't really know how to deal with it until I was about six, and my mother won a piano on the radio. There was a contest, and she was the third caller, believe it or not. <clears throat> so uh, as soon as that piano entered our home, it was my sanctuary. And I just started playing on my own, and then a piano teacher would come to the house once a week for many years. and. I just always, it's like I sat down and I knew how to play. It Mm -hmm. was um, my voice and it allowed me to express myself and um, explore my emotions in a way that nothing else in my life did. And that set me on the trajectory for the rest of my life. Where do you you think your passion comes from that has (laughs) now given you the energy past your childhood experience to be Mm -hmm. able to continue to perform and record? Some people listen to the radio or see visuals like you. And for me, I hear music constantly in my head, and I always have. And I thought this was something that just was human. (laughs) But I didn't find out until many years later that this was actually my gift 
Um, and I think we each have something uniquely special and important for the world. And this was mine. So I can, I'm very inspired by visuals, obviously, yours in particular. Uh, but I'm also inspired by uh, anything I might look at, something I might hear, a snippet of conversation, hugely inspired by nature. Um, mm -hmm. And when I see these things and experience these things, I hear it through music. And I, there's just constantly music playing in my head. So I've gone for three years once with a broken radio in my car and <laughs> never bothered to fix it. <laughs> I didn't need it. So, well, yeah. Well, what, what you do with our moving art series is so incredible because, you know, we have these images of nature. If people haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. So you can check it out. But, you know, we strain these images together, whether it's about oceans or flowers. And the music is such an important element of tying it all together mm. because it has a constant through line that pulls you on, it takes you on a journey. Right. It's kind of like a locomotive pulling a train down the track. It's right. beautiful that it has a linear progression to it. Mm. And um, when, when we jammed together, Elizabeth, I so appreciate the fact that you create this continuity <laughs> for the imagery. And I know the imagery probably triggers, you know, these vision, the, the music in your head. Mm. Uh, you want can we talk about that process sure. a little bit? Sure. One of the beautiful things about writing music for visuals, specifically for yours, is to find and create themes that can um, come in and out of a, a growing orchestral or um, instrumental sound and try and find a way to take people on a journey musically that matches the journey that you're taking them on visually. And I absolutely love that challenge. If I find it so inspiring. <laughs> um, and it may be that, uh, for instance, Machu Picchu, we start with a very, very simple um, theme that comes in on guitar that then later reappears with a full 60 piece uh, vocal track and orchestra, mm -hmm. later with Pedro Eustache's um, Beautiful World Winds. So it's, um, it's like putting a puzzle together, actually, <laughs> musically. And it's just, uh, uh, it's a beautiful journey that, mm -hmm. that I find happens very organically. Yeah. Um, it's oftentimes, I'm not sitting there thinking, okay, now this theme has to go here, and then this needs to, it just, I watch and it happens. And when I revisit, I see, oh, look at this structure. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's not always that way, but I love when that happens. It's the same thing, you know, works for me too, Elizabeth, is that, you know, I've learned to listen to your inner voice. Yes. I'm not directing anything. You know, yes. it, I'm, my, I hear in my head, this shot follows this shot. And yeah. then, oh, let's go to that shot. And then yeah. let's do this. And then let's do a dissolve or whatever. And yeah. I'm just you know, trying to listen. I, I have to kind of kickstart it in the beginning, kind of rough it into shape. But then after that, I learned to let go. Yes. I learned that a long time Same. ago, that the creative process is really about letting go. Yes, you know? absolutely. I agree. And I experience that too. When I'm scoring films, I decide on a sound palette. I decide, you know, some thematic ideas come up. And then, as you said, I just let go. And yeah. once you have the tools, you can just move with it. Yeah. So I want to give our viewers a chance to connect with some of these great moments in your work. And you mentioned Machu Picchu, so I think we mm -hmm. will probably want to show a clip of that. And I want to make a note that, you know, you play such a wide variety of, of world music and instruments, and you bring that. And in Machu Picchu, obviously, you know, it's Peru. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful to bring that flavor yeah. into the score. And, and to feel the richness of these world influences. Mm -hmm. So let's um, play the last view from your album uh, and the Moving Art Netflix episode called Machu Picchu.
Wow. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's uh, right back at you. <laughs> oh, let me share something with the viewers. That is more sacred than being there. I'll tell you why. Because when I was shooting it, there are tons of tourists <laughs> that are like so. getting in front of my camera. I actually spent about $20,000 getting rid of people that walked in front of my camera and all my time lapse shots wow. to create this pristine view of this beautiful, empty, gorgeous, sacred place called Machu Picchu. And in terms of the sound, lots of uh, Asian tourists being loud, talking on their WhatsApp mobile phone in, in front of your face. So the reality um, isn't quite as good as what we just experienced. So, um, you know, <laughs> well, it's a I way think, to yeah. soak up this spiritual sacred energy in, in a way that I think is even better than the real thing. Plus, you don't have to travel two and a half days to get there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, well, and with COVID, you can't travel. So why not go halfway around the world to, to, to Machu Picchu? I think that's one of the beautiful things that we can do is give people a, an entirely unique experience that even yeah. if you go to Machu Picchu or even if you sit in my room while I'm composing, you will not have the same experience as what we just saw. <laughs> yeah, so. what, what I really love too, especially in the Machu Picchu piece, is you know that all those diverse musical instruments mm. and, and world influences. I was curious, you know, where does that um, inspiration of these global styles come from for you? <laughs> That's such a good question. Um, I uh, grew up with an Armenian family. I am Armenian. And uh, my grandfather sang and my grandmother sang and played lots of different instruments and um, daduk and oud. So I was um, exposed to that as a child. And I think it really... Um, became immersed in my cells because as I grew I just was fascinated with world music and I studied um, African and Cuban percussion and toured with a Afro-Cuban group as a percussionist for wow. a while um, I've studied harps and woodwinds and of course all different vocal techniques um, I'm fascinated by um, lots of different guitars, um, Bolivian and the charango, which I played here, um, classical, steel, lap, dulcimer. Um, I love the harmonium, which is also in this piece we just heard, which is primarily from India and Tibet. Um, I'm just fascinated with the idea that we are a global community and that we can take all the sounds that are part of our culture, our own unique culture, and combine them mm -hmm. and use them to express our own unique emotional voice. Um, so that's a long-winded answer to your question. Well, Louis, no, it's but... beautiful. Look at it. Speak of when you said voice, you left mm -hmm. out the most amazing instrument of all that you do have is your voice. I mean, Thank I think you. you're famous for that and have contributed in many, many future films. Yeah. How did you discover that you have a elegant, enchanting, beautiful voice? That's really interesting. I never knew I could sing. Um, I got actually kidded about it when I was, a, was it, I was a child. So I was very, very shy and I used to hide in my closet and set up headphones so I could sing harmonies with the music I was listening to, but so no one would hear me because <laughs> <laughs> I was in my closet. Um, so I was um, playing piano actually for a dance class and someone, I used to hum along to the melodies I would make up and someone heard me singing and that person just happened to have started an internship with Hans Zimmer. Wow. I know it's such divine intervention. And so he came over to me and said, would you be interested in singing for Hans? He's working on a film that needs a voice just like yours. And I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't even know who Hans was. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about irony. 
the next day I started my singing career and I started to uh, really experiment with my voice and just fall in love with what I could do if I moved the air up into my nose or if I kept it way down in my chest or if I moved really close to the mic and used a whisper tone or if I stepped farther away and just screamed. You know, I just started this experimentation that um, I found was the deepest, deepest way of communicating emotions for me. And it was just a beautiful and very accidental discovery. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did because yeah. it's, it's a giant gift to the world. Thank and you. I know it's helped a lot of people feel inspired and, and even healed. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you're also like me, inspired by nature. Yes, and I certainly I believe so. that nature is intelligent and a healing modality. Can you talk about your connection to the natural world and how that m inspires the music that you compose? Yes. One of the things I used to love to do as a child was crawl out my bedroom window. Don't try this at home. <laughs> and climb down the garage and run um, down to the end of the street across a very busy intersection <laughs> and into the woods. And there I would find the river, the Charles River, which I grew up near. And I was fascinated. I would sit there for hours and listen to the sounds um, of the rushing and when it would slow down or speed up. And I would watch sticks and leaves fall into it. It was like I was prepping to work with you, Lou. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, I, I was would... prepping... <laughs> Too, I, I, in Brooklyn, I would race my popsicle sticks down the gutter. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm fascinated. I still do that. Like I water in the backyard and, yeah. you know, you have like runoff little streams on the pavement or whatever. And I watch little sticks, you know, yeah. Yeah. little pieces of debris floating. And I'm always curious, like, is it going to go right? Is it going to go yeah. left? You I'm are starting. Still, <laughs> you are I'm enchanted by watching wh how water flows Yes. in the built environment. <laughs> yes. It's pretty amazing. So yeah. let's let's have a, the ability and listen to some beautiful music Elizabeth did for our Oceans episode as we take a journey along the shores of Big Sur. Wow, it's so beautiful. Your voice with that soaring eagle. <laughs> if nothing else will lift your spirit. That certainly does. Yeah, I, I want our audience to know that Elizabeth is in her recording studio. Yes. And I have asked if she would actually perform live for us today, which she's going to do. I'd be happy to. Um, she's going to play a drift. And, you know, her voice and has been her guide, her healer her expressive center, it's her love, it's it's her connection to the world. And I really love that um, when we talked about it earlier, you know, you shared how much like when you're at the piano, it truly does inspire you. And that when you're playing something healing, I think you know it because you get goosebumps. Yes, and, that's my barometer. <laughs> that's your barometer for creating a healing modality. So... Yes. Um, here is a gift, um, some live music that is coming from the deepest part of Elizabeth's soul. <laughs> this is a piece called Adrift, and it is actually on the Moving Arts Best of Season 3 soundtrack, which you'll find on Spotify. 
Um, and this is um, sort of my own um, improvisation and piano arrangement of the many layers that you previously heard on the score. That's so great. Thank I'm healed. <laughs> I'm healed. I know I know you studied healing. Yes. And I know that just like, you know, connecting with nature can have a real positive effect on your mental health Absolutely. Uh, and well-being. Mm -hmm. I mean, music has a positive effect on you know, such a broad range of physical and psychological conditions like mm -hmm. dementia, anxiety, depression, even cancer. Yeah, and I think really, coming out of yeah. the pandemic there's going to be a giant mental health crisis, mm -hmm. which we're, which already existed, but has certainly been made worse by us being deprived of the basic need of, of, of connection. Yes. I was curious. Um, I mean, what are, are there notes or chords mm -hmm. that are, you know, healing? Yes. Yeah. I've always been fascinated with healing and I always put out an intention when I create music and when I sing that it, um, uplift people, that it open people's hearts, that it relieves pain, anxiety, fear, um, in whatever capacity uh, that's needed. And so when I write, I'm drawn to certain chords, notes, the concept of tension and release, like uh, those uh, three notes from the piece I just played. And come down here. So it's. I find life uh, is a beautiful expression of tension and release, whatever we're doing. And if I can find that release for people, I will always, always be drawn to that. Just opening chords like this, or just the expanse that's possible. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about 
the piano <laughs> because you can. I mean, that's like breathing to yeah. me, that sound. Um, and I do the same thing with my voice. Uh, a very simple, soft tone or a louder. And it's always, always coming from my heart and always coming from my soul. And I get a certain feeling in my stomach and in my, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, in, in my chest that when it's working. And I, I'm sure you know what I mean, Louis. You know when something's working. Yeah. And for me, working means creating something that is going to move people. So that's just a little window into... <laughs> my process well that's why we call it moving art that's it, right <laughs> it has to move you in yes. order for it to be effective you yeah. know you told me that the other day that um that florence nightingale mm -hmm. used to use music to heal soldiers like a yes. century ago right she started in the 1800s using music and in the world wars they also used music in surgery for pain relief for anxiety uh, which I found fascinating. And, of course, the whole uh, business of music therapy is based on what music can do to relieve anxiety and pain. So I think that um, it's a very, very important part of our lives, and especially now during the pandemic. Yes. Where we need it. <laughs> For sure. Well, I think that the, um, the music is like um, a wavelength of energy, right? Mm -hmm. that somehow modulates the neurons in our brain. And I, I feel the same thing is true with my imagery. It is. You know, the imagery is, you know, hits the retina, becomes electrical impulse to the brain. Mm -hmm. And yes. the brain creates context between the music and the visuals mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. also generates meaning. Yes. And I think for each individual, there's a different meaning. You know, yes, which yes. is what I think art tries to inspire people to lean into, mm -hmm. to to contribute to the experience, and yeah, to add like, to it. Mm -hmm. You're creating a world that they step into. I'm sure everyone's had the experience of watching a TV show late at night and then dreaming about the characters when you're asleep. You know, it's like we we enter into the worlds that we hear and see. And so the thing I love about what you and I do, Louis, is that we can create these beautiful worlds for people to enter into and experience um, uh, whenever they want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, especially now. And I think that um, you know, one, of, one of the uh, little aha moments I've had recently is that, you know, my imagery is, you know, I, I want people to be inspired to go outdoors and to experience mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. However, you know, right now it's, it's difficult to go to, you know, exotic locations because of the fact you can't travel. And when you do go to these exotic locations, a lot of them are being overrun by, by tourism and commercial yeah. interests in these countries that are far, far away. So, you know, the fact that it's quote unquote digital, yes. I feel is as good as the real thing just like I wouldn't criticize or judge your music that it is digital, right. right? I mean, I'd rather be able to hear your music and not be deprived from listening to it live. That's right. a different experience. But right. if I limited myself only to listening to live music, I never would have heard the Beatles you know, <laughs> right. or other great artists that I never had a chance to go to a, a concert to, right? It is a, such an interesting subject you bring up because there is a huge difference between experiencing something live, a, a concert or standing in the middle of a field, and seeing it uh, digitally or hearing it digitally. But in this time when the world is so crowded and we are not even able to connect to nature or each other, this is such a beautiful uh, option to have right. always. Um, because as we said earlier, we're creating something new 
um, a very unique experience and a, a new place that we can go whenever we want. So, so in the moment, Elizabeth, do you feel, mm -hmm. can you play something else? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. I would love that because I love the fact that it's live. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we've the never heard it before. Certainly not this version. I love sort of improvising on pieces that I've written, um, as I just did. This is a song that was used um, in the series Tumbelief, which I wrote for for four years and absolutely loved. And I wrote it for a sleeping sequence, and I cannot tell you how many uh, emails, letters I've gotten from parents who have said, Oh my gosh, I just play that section over and over and my children go to sleep. <laughs> so it's that whole idea of comfort, um, which is where this song came from. All the stars in the sky say good night. And the moon whispers sweetly sleep tight Close your eyes and drift off to sleep My little one Well close your eyes cause you're in the arms beautiful i wish you could hear the applause from the audiences up there. it's so it's so beautiful oh, um you know people have shared stories with us about how many of our films you know brings them calm and healing and how our work has been used also in healthcare to demonstrate improved outcomes but we also get incredible notes from our viewers on the ways that the imagery is impacting your lives and these are just comments on Netflix where you, you can't leave a comment, but you have to find yes. on the, find me on the internet somehow and be able to leave a comment, which is, that takes a lot of work. I, I don't think I would do that. There'd be too many clicks to figure out how to find somebody by surfing the web. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, can we, can we put up some of those comments or I could just read them? So great, my, my body was healed of chronic inflammation by using the series as a meditation day after day. This is healing work. 
Just yesterday, I was at the very depth of illness. I must fight daily depression. But by the time the movie had ended, I was thanking God that I was still alive. That's so special. Here's another one. Moving art is saving my life, literally. I'm grateful beyond measure for the gift that has allowed me to finally get some sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm an Iraq combat veteran. I just want to let you know that your work on moving art has really helped improve my conditions tremendously. Thank you for helping me in this healing process. Here's another one. I had a severe injury and have beaten the odds of recovery due in large part to watching moving art on almost a daily basis for over two years. And I've shared it with my friends. I love this one. I have a son who is 17. He's autistic. He loves, and I mean literally loves, the moving art series. For his 17th birthday, he wanted a moving art party where we all sat and watched the film with him. So That's great. I'm sure you got beautiful quotes too, Elizabeth. Are there any that you'd like to share? Uh, sure. I've gotten so many. Um, here's one. Thank you for producing incredible music. I needed a healing sound in these times. You are giving me that. Please know you are helping people and moving some of us to tears of joy and happiness. Uh, another. Your music is just incredible. So happy to have discovered you. Such wonderful healing sounds. I heard your voice and was moved to tears. I get a lot of this. Thank you for blessing the universe with your spectacular voice. Oh. It's so amazing when we get these because I'm always shocked and stunned at the depth of the experience people have from our work. Um, and it certainly is our intention and it's so good to know that it's happening. And I got a wonderful one the other day, Louie, that I forgot to tell you. Someone from Ireland sent me an email saying that he and his wife had decided to name their newborn baby girl after me <laughs> because they had heard my work in Narnia <laughs> and were so moved by it. And I just, I mean, that one made me cry. But uh, oh, yeah, it's just, it's such a wonderful. Well, it's story. beautiful because you know, I know for myself, and I think for you as well, I, I don't have like a, an intention that, the, mm -hmm. that it's a healing modality. We just want to create beautiful Yes. you know, art. Yeah. And um, it's, it's amazing that people claim that it's a healing modality. I mean, the reality is here's a series on Netflix. It's probably in a category maybe called documentary nature, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hundreds of comments come in that mm -hmm. people have been healed. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that it just emanates, you know, from, from the audience mm -hmm. and all of these stories um, I get about one every other day, you yes. know, literally, and it just it melts your heart. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think there, I mean, there is a much more in-depth scientific exploration that we could go through um, about tuning, like 440. I, I noticed someone's asking about 440 versus yeah. um, 432 about... Um, different hertz of music like 580 is something that people talk a lot about as being uh, a healing place to sit musically um, sonically and I have found that so much of this is unique and individual for people images that may um, move one person may not resonate with another right there, and so I noticed we have an audience question about uh, mm -hmm. the, the tuning and um, I, I heard this story a long time ago, Rachmaninoff, whenever he would have someone tune his piano, would always have someone tune, I think it was the middle register, like um, one cent above the lower and the higher registers, because that felt right to him when he played. And uh, my experience is, as long as we're all in tune, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as long as there's harmony, then I feel that uh, the healing elements can happen and can come through. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it without going into a lot of 
a, a lot more detail, but but I think that it's it's just all about harmony and resonance. Yeah, truly. Um, when, I was, when I was filming uh, Wings of Life, mm. you know, for Disney Nature, which is on Apple. No, I'm sorry, it's on Disney Plus now. Meryl Streep tells the story yes. from the point of view of a flower. Yes, I love that. Making love to bees, bats, hummingbirds, and butterflies. Yes. And um, so we're shooting something called buzz pollination, yeah. which is when a bumblebee lands on a tomato flower, it grabs that flower and it vibrates its wings at the same frequency as the C note. Yes, I know and, that. Yes. You know, and, and to prove that, which is just mind blowing, yes. is that we got a tuning fork. And you know, and you we you know you hit it and you touch the flower and the pollen comes out. So the flower has a very specific so amazing <laughs> messenger suitor yes. that it wants to use to transfer its pollen from one flower to another. Mm -hmm. And if it if it doesn't get that vibration, mm -hmm. it won't release its pollen, which I thought is just like mind blowing. It is mind blowing and phenomenal that the world is all about vibrations and we're constantly communicating that with each other. And I mean, even scoring, you know, you, you see a sad scene, you want a minor key, you, you see tension, you want close clusters of notes, you want expansion when you see a beautiful nature scene. And this is the world we're in. This is every yeah. day we are constantly communicating this way. And uh, I love it. I, yeah. It's we just have the symphony. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, look, the vibrations and your science that proves it now, this thing about, you know, heart rate variability and coherence. You know, you walk into a room, sometimes you can be at a party and there's like a bunch of strangers, but you walk to the person that you think you're going to connect to. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot to do with the, you know, rhythm of your heart rate and their rhythm of their heart rate. Yes. You know, yes. It's, and it's instantaneous. It's, it's in the microsecond that you kind of glance around. So your heart is speaking to the brain, mm -hmm. motivating, you know, you in, in, in your actions, which I think is just remarkable. Yeah. I, again, wonder and awe, the series is like, you know, that intersection between art and science. I love the fact that the science kind of proves what we instinctually know, like mm -hmm. love is a good thing. Yeah. You know, they find out that, you know, less prostate cancer and breast cancer and, you know, yes. all the stress when people are in love, you know, yes. and, but that's been, you know, used in poetry and music for thousands and thousands of years. Yes. And now we have evidence that there are chemicals that are released. We can figure that out, you know, yes. the endorphins, the serotonin, and, you know, it's great that there's like efficacy to it, mm -hmm. but it's also nice to just, you know, trust your gut. Yes. I think the most uh, trustworthy healing modality is your gut, <laughs> your yeah, voice. <laughs> I know. And here again, science has figured out that you got brain cells in your gut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you right. know, that, right. and, and along with the fun guy, they're having a great party, you know? Yeah. And they're sending this information up to your brain. And so that, that saying, you know, gut instinct is so true that yes. decisions, certain decisions are definitely made from, from down here. Mm -hmm. And decisions about, you know, that come from the heart to deal with compassion, et cetera, mm -hmm. definitely come from the heart. So it's a beautiful thing to realize that your whole body is one giant unified organism, right? Mind, body, mm -hmm. soul. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I think your music touches. Uh, there, there's a question here from Catherine about the Machu Picchu sequence. Mm -hmm. Like um, she says, had... Did you get it filmed totally empty <laughs> and it's only packed with tourists? And yes, no, the experience couldn't be the same since we're not birds. Or <laughs> yes, that's true. And as I said earlier, we we struggled. You know, we got we paid to get special permits to try to get in early. But even so, it did not eliminate all of the people that you walk in front of your camera. And so digitally in some of the time-lapse shots, we frame by frame removed the people. It was expensive, it was painstaking, mm, but wow. I want people to see it without it looking like an ant farm. Yeah. And um, that, sacred, that sacred spirit needs to be nurtured and it needs yeah. to be saved. And a lot of sacred places 
it's sad, on earth are disappearing, yeah. either due to climate change or to commercial, you know, commercialization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we have to like, you know, save it digitally, it, at least it's one step in the right direction on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, you know, with, with, with the pandemic now, um, I was wondering how music, you know, is such an important model for healing because of what's going on and, mm -hmm. and the suffering, which, you know, can manifest into stress, frustration, sickness, anger, complacency. Have you experienced anyone in your life who has found a way to healing through music in a personal way? So many people. I have a dear friend whose um, close friend was experiencing cancer and uh, was in a hospital in Nevada. And she is a huge fan of mine. And so she brought my music to the hospital room wow. where this woman was receiving treatment and largely on morphine just at this point in time because she was in so much pain and the doctors were saying she would pass away by the morning. So she brought my music and played it literally in a loop all night. Uh, she brought Fair Sky, which you had mentioned earlier, and she brought another album of mine called Rough and Steep. And in the morning, her friend was awake, eating, talking, and lived for another two months. Wow. And she kept just playing the music over and over. And I just thought, well, if that isn't a sign at the power of, first of all, belief and music and allowing yourself to be still and really um, ingest the energy that's being created by music and uh, mine in particular at that moment, uh, is so important. And I, a couple people had asked me before we were doing this podcast, Louis, if we were going to talk about recommendations on how to deal with anxiety and fear during this time um, using what we both create. And my suggestion would be don't be afraid to be still and allow yourself to experience what we create because it will change you. It will change your mood. It will change uh, how you're feeling physically. And it will uplift you. Um, I, I can say that 100% sure, being 100% sure, it will change you. And I think, I mean, in, in this world that is, we're constantly being barraged by... <laughs> You know, you go. You can't go to a website without fifty pop-up ads coming in, and it makes me want to take a hammer to the computer and break it. <laughs> Honestly, namaste. But <laughs> but I think then we have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. We have to be proactive and a lot time for our own self-care and our own healing. And music and nature visuals have to be a part of that. And your life will change. I swear. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Louie, but. No, I agree. If anything, I, I, I ask myself, I should be practicing what I preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard. It's hard. It's We're hard. We're told not to, and that it'll be better if you eat a pint of ice cream. You'll feel better. No, you won't. <laughs> you no. Know. No, I mean, look, I, I hate to exercise, and recently, <laughs> My body's been really stiff and all that. Mm -hmm. And I now I'm, I'm putting on moving art as I exercise. Good. Because Perfect. I have like a, I'm not in the gym doing this driving tempo, but I'm allowing my mind to go on a journey and I'm letting go and just can, associating with, you know, my muscles feeling tired, you know, mm -hmm. and before I know it, it's great, man. I just had this beautiful, relaxing experience. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've discovered a, a, a new way of using it. It doesn't have to be necessarily for meditation. It can also be. Oh, no, for... I mean, that's where people classically go. It's like, oh, I need music to meditate too. But guess what? <laughs> you can use music to exercise, to heal, to um, be inspired, to paint, to write. 
uh, visuals, same, anything. Yeah. And I just noticed we have another question. Yeah, a um, great question. Uh, Christine yeah. Jacoby says, do you write the music for an edited film or is it a back and forth process? Mm. Um, usually uh, when I write, when I score for a film, I get um, what's called a locked version of the film. But very often times, as we all know, art is a process. The director, <laughs> the director will um, want to change something. So in the middle of the process, we'll insert uh, a scene that's slightly shorter than it was, and I make adjustments musically. But yes, almost always I'm writing to a locked picture um, so that I have a sense of what the director had in mind as a visual journey. For example, when Louie and I worked together, I worked with a locked picture. I think there was one addition at the end, mm -hmm. Louie, when we worked together, um, yeah. because we hadn't gotten to quite what, what the end was going to be. And then right. we w both went back and forth about what, right. oh, will this work? Will that? Should it be this length or shorter? So there was a bit of back and forth there. Yeah, but, I, I love the back and forth. I mean, yes. I agree. I mean. Well, to make your life uh, you know, <laughs> simpler and not crazy, I do have to give you a locked picture. Right. That means a finished edit. Right. But then once I get it, you know, I, I do do, we tweak it, you know, might only be like one or two frames where, you know, I can, you know, shorten my shot. It doesn't matter if I lose a fraction of a second. So right. maybe if it hits a beat or helps right. the transition. Right. So I, I definitely fine tune it once right. we get, the, the score back to really do the final polish. Ah, yes. And it's like really, you know, it's like the final polish in anything is like that little 5% of effort is a hundred. Oh my gosh, it makes such a difference. <laughs> Big difference, you know, it's and, and I've got room. flexibility as a, you know, that I think musicians don't like, you know, if my, if my shot is like two seconds and a half or two and a quarter, it doesn't really matter, but in music, it does matter. You know that that phrase needs to be right. It has a rhythm and a cadence. You can't just randomly right. chop well, a fraction yes. of a second out of a piece of music. And I can take a fraction of a second out of a shot, and it doesn't really, you know, affect anything in a very negative way at all. So, mm -hmm. I love to definitely fine tune it. Yeah. But I think what I love working with you so much is that basically. What we do is we just talk about our feelings. We talk about our emotion. Like, mm -hmm. what is, what do, what do we want to feel when we're in that valley or on that mountaintop or inside that you know Machu Picchu or on the beach? It's right. it's about emotion, right? And and you you translate those feelings into music. Yes, and the interesting thing about that about working as composer and director is that it's so important for the composer to know what the director was intending or seeing at any given moment because what I might be seeing may differ from what you were thinking about where you were filming that. And I remember we had one moment in uh, the Machu Picchu film where I was seeing something as a, like a celebration, a journey coming to a, a destination. And you said, oh, well, wait a minute, that's not exactly what's happening here. And and then I looked at it and I thought, ah, I see, we're not there yet. <laughs> so <laughs> musically, that changed tremendously yeah. what my approach to that scene was. So I just love that. Um, yeah. The creative and what, and, you know, be, just beyond the, the specifics of what we do, this whole idea of having a symbiotic relationship Mm -hmm. is nature's operating instructions right you know that's how that makes the world go around that's how we work nothing lives alone in nature yeah. so whether you know we're we're building a shed or we're creating a you know a piece of film uh collaborating with others is really um a joy yes a true joy because yeah can't do it all by yourself you know no, you can't and you're not meant to i mean we're exactly. affected by everything and each other in the world, as is nature, is affected by everything around it uh, tremendously. So it's yeah. so important to remember that. I, I wanted to mention also the um, the Fair Sky CD you did, mm. which is you know performed in Armenian. 
Yes. Because uh, as you mentioned earlier, that your mother is Armenian. Right. And um, I can really relate to perhaps, you know, the intention of that in terms of the fact that you used um, Armenian language. Is, mm -hmm. is What's the language called? Armenian. Uh, <laughs> Armenian, okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's a unique language. It's probably yes. the only speak it in Armenia, right? Yes. <laughs> and, um, but I think it was to, you know, maybe honor and address the suffering that, you know, this group of people have gone through. My parents were Holocaust yes. survivors. I can totally yes. relate to that. Yes. Can, can you share your, what, what your thoughts and intentions were in doing that? I did want to honor um, the language, the culture, the experience of the people. And I grew up hearing horrific stories about my grandmother and her experience, my grandfather and his experience, and, you know, leaving their parents dying in the desert while they were being forced to, you know, it's just hideous watching. I can't even, I won't even say it. But they were, they had such a huge impact on me that I wanted to somehow honor that part of my life and my culture and also bring light to it. Um, because I think, I don't, um, I don't know the right way to say this, but I think it's so important when we experience such deep suffering to um, point the camera, if you will, at the joy and the resilience of the people mm -hmm. and um, the culture and the experience of who they are as human beings. So that's what I was trying to do with uh, one piece in particular called The Light that's on Fair Sky. Uh, and it's just, it's all about walking towards a light. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I took that painstaking and painful journey that we all know about through history and sort of tilted it on its side, mm -hmm. if you will and made it about walking into a new place, into a light, into a new beginning, away from the pain and suffering. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like that probably inspired you to create this foundation I heard about, yes. where you give these small grants to women and girls in financial need who want to lift their own lives and yes. the lives of those around them. Yes. So um, It's called the Forgotten Dream Project, and it's something I've just been doing very quietly for the past five or six years, giving about four or five grants a year. And yeah, if people are interested, they can, um, to find out more, they can visit me at my website, elizabethscottmusic.com. Awesome. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess in, 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 in Buddhism, they say that, you know, suffering, you know, is a, is a gift that opens your heart. Yes. You know, yes, and it's and it's, it looks like you're, you know, paying this forward in a sense by helping others. You know, yeah, I think it's such an important thing for all of us. Yeah, yeah. So, wow, Elizabeth, I think we're close <laughs> to the end of our little, yeah. you know, conversation. It was so beautiful to mm -hmm. hear you play live. Thank you, Louie. And um, I hope it reverberates throughout the universe. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll bounce off of Mars and come back. And we'll, you know, we'll have yeah. a bunch of like, next time we'll have comments from Martians. <laughs> it, it healed them, you know, which I think would be really great. Because I had I no think intention. they're probably of... already in the audience, Louie. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> they're everywhere. No, thank you either the universe that. is a loving universe or it's not. And I think it's loving. <laughs> So there, there must be loving aliens all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to thank you for sharing your music, mm. your spirit, your voice with us. Um, My pleasure. It's so, so cool to be hanging with you. Yeah. And thank I you. also want to be able to thank um, our sponsor, um, the Fetzer Institute for sponsoring our podcast, helping to build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Also want to thank our producer, Sean, and, and Leland and Annie, Courtney and Sarah from Moving Art, and Bethany, Ron, and Deanna from Magical Threads. Um, to be continued and more yes. to come. Yes, thank you, Louie, for your work.